All right, well, it's daylight savings time and it's also the start of spring break for Pinellas County Schools. So some of y'all might be thinking you were here at the earlier service, but you're here now or online if you're joining us and you didn't make it, but you're getting your cup of coffee here. Hey, if you're here at Tyrone, Seminole, downtown, online, whenever, however you're watching us, glad that you are with us. It does not matter where you are or what you're doing as long as you're tuning in and in community with us here at Bridgepoint Church. We're glad, we're happy to have you here. So we are continuing our sermon series called When You Pray, which is a series about, you guessed it, prayer. We're focusing on all things related to prayer, what it is, why it matters, and how to do it. Now, if you missed last week, you're gonna to wanna to go and check it out on demand online. It was a great start to the series. And Tyler started us off highlighting some of the questions that we tend to have about prayer. Some of the assumptions that many of us are prone to make and some of the common misconceptions that we have when it comes to prayer, such as prayer being viewed as some sort of religious obligation, something that we must do or we have to just check off a list as if God has this checkbox that we have to fulfill. Right, as if it's a prerequisite that God expects from us before we take that first bite of food or before we put our head on the pillow at night. Friends, the aim of this series is to discover what is found in the Bible about prayer, what Jesus talks about when he talks about prayer, what Jesus teaches about prayer so that you and I will know what we can do when we pray. Throughout this series, we're gonna be landing in, camping out in Matthew chapter six, verses five through 14. Matthew being a book of the Bible, one of the four gospels that's found in the New Testament, which is the, the second part of the Bible. And a gospel is basically the account of Jesus's life, his ministry, his miracles, his death, his resurrection. So Matthew's gospel is Matthew's account of Jesus's life. And as we're camping out in the sixth chapter of Matthew's gospel, uh, it's here that Jesus is giving a sermon, uh, a sermon on the side of a mountain. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And he's giving this message to his disciples who are his followers and also some of the folks that have heard about him, heard of his teaching, and they've started to gather around him. And some of the teaching that we find in this prayer, or excuse me, in this sermon is on the topic of prayer. As we uh, looked at last week, Jesus begins his teaching on prayer, not with uh, this detailed instructions telling you what to do first. Jesus starts his teaching on prayer by telling them what prayer is not, what not to do when they pray. And Jesus tells them when you pray first, don't make a big scene. Don't, don't turn it into a dramatic performance as if there's a spotlight on you or if God is watching you perform. He's basically saying, don't make prayer about you. Don't let the focus of prayer be on you. Jesus makes it clear that prayer is not a way for us to try and prove our spiritual maturity or an opportunity for us to try and impress the people around us uh, with fancy words and using them in an articulate manner. And it's certainly not a way of us uh, being able to impress God. God's not impressed when we make it a performance. Instead, Jesus teaches that prayer is first and foremost communion with God. It's, it's being present with God. It is a humble and honest conversation with our heavenly father. It's direct access to the one who has created the heavens and the earth. It's the uh, direct access to the one who is in control, the one who is all powerful and all knowing. And as we looked at last week, the one who knows what it is that we need before we even get around to asking for it, which raises some questions. Questions like, if God is all powerful, if God is all knowing, and if God knows what is best, and if everything happens according to God's plans, then what is the point of prayer, right? What is the purpose of praying? Why do our prayers matter? Why should we bother praying? And if we do bother praying, then what should we pray for? And so friends, that's the big question that I want us to start from today. The big question being this, what should we pray for if God is really in control of all that happens? What should be the, the content of our prayers? What should we ask for? What should we talk to God about? What should we pray for specifically if God really is in control of all that happens? What do we say to God? What does God expect us to say? What does he expect to hear from us? What should we be telling God? What should we be asking from God? 
See, if you're anything like me, then the, the, the content of the prayers can sometimes be tricky. It can sometimes be challenging. And you sometimes don't know what to say. And I've found this to be true uh, with our kids, teaching our kids not only about prayer, but about the content of the prayer. It's become somewhat of a challenge. All right, in, in the James family, we have a nine-year-old daughter and an almost four-year-old son. And we've tried to prioritize prayer in our house, talking to the kids about what prayer means, why it matters, and, and how it's an everyday conversation with God, not taking away from the reverence of who God is, but not making it uh, some sort of obligation or ritualistic as if you have to do it this way or that way. So we've been talking to them about prayer and we try to incorporate prayer in all aspects of life. We'll pray with the kids on the way to school. Admittedly, sometimes it's that last minute prayer right before car line before they jump out of the truck and head into school. But we make prayer a priority. With mom, it's a nice long prayer walking to school with me. It's like, oh goodness, we forgot to pray. Let's get it in real quick. We pray before school. We pray before meals. We pray before bedtime. And we pray with them and talk to them about praying at various times throughout the day. But while I'm noticing that they're picking up on the importance of prayer, I'm noticing that we're needing to focus in on and pay a little bit more attention to the content of their prayers, especially with our almost four-year-old son. Cameron, that's his name. He will often volunteer to pray before a meal. And it's not that he just loves to pray. It's that he's trying to beat his sister to the punch because he just doesn't want her praying. So it becomes a competition. He wins, he gets to pray. And the way Cameron prays is interesting. It's cute to me and it's, it's neat that he kind of puts his hands together. He claps his hands together. He interlocks his fingers and he bows his head and then he squints his eyes real tight. And after a couple of seconds, he opens up one of his eyes. <laughs> and then he opens them both up and he's just, his eyes are wide open. And so he's there, hands together, fingers interlocked, head down, but he's looking around. And if we're at the dinner table, it's usually a uh, uh, mom, dad, sister, Cameron, plate of food. And so what he does, he says, God, uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for my mom. Thank you for my dad. Thank you for my sister. Thank you for my chicken nuggets, my mac and cheese, and my strawberries. Jesus' name, amen. And then we start to eat. It's efficient, it's good, I like it, it's to the point, it's good, but it never fails. He always prays for whatever it is in front of him. He has to look at it, he has to see it. He only prays for whatever is in front of him. Sometimes it's thank you for the lamp, thank you for Alexa. Alexa, can you pray for me? It's, he sees it around. It's what he sees, what he's focused on. And I'm thinking I need to start using this to my benefit and possibly taking my wallet out and putting it next to his plate. So when it's mom, dad, sister, nuggets, mac and cheese, strawberries, we can offer and ask a blessing on dad's wallet so that the contents in it will expand and grow. Partly kidding, partly kidding. He prays for whatever is in front of him, what he sees, what he's focused on. And while it's cute, I don't think it's just a four-year-old tendency or the way that we've taught him to pray in the James household. I think a lot of us tend to do the same thing. We pray for whatever it is that is right in front of us. We pray for whatever it is that we're able to see, whatever it is that we're looking at, whatever it is that we're looking toward, whatever it is that we are focusing on, either what we can see or don't see and want to see, that's often the focus of our prayers. Friends, there was a study done by Lifeway, which is a Christian retailer out of Nashville, and they asked a group of Christians about their prayer life, and this is what they found. In this group of Christians, they found that 48% of them, 48% of Christians pray every day. A Christian being is someone who not only believes in Jesus, but, but says that I'm a follower of Jesus. This group of Christians, they found that 48%, which is less than half, pray every day. And what are they praying for? These are some overlapping percentages. 74% of them said that they're praying for their personal needs and circumstances. Their personal needs needs and their circumstances. 42% of those that pray are praying for forgiveness of sin. It incorporates in their prayers a forgiveness of sin, sin being anything that separates us from God or one another. And so it's a, a forgive me for this, that, and the other that separates me from you and from others. And then 41% pray for that winning lottery ticket for their team to win or the parking spot right up next to the store. Again, 74%, it's about them. It's about us, personal happiness, health, and wealth. 
42% asking for forgiveness and mercy from wrongdoing, from something that was a mistake, either last night, past, present, asking for forgiveness. God, forgive me for this, that, and the other. And then 41% praying for lottery team, perfect parking spot. Friends, I'm not the best mathematician, but if we add it up, that's, that's like 157% of the prayers that people are asking are about them. That's not the right percentage. Y'all need to fact check me because there's not 157% there. A majority of the prayers are about us. A majority of the prayers are about our needs, our wants, what we'd like. You see, this study not only found that, that a majority of Christians do not pray, but when they do, it's an opportunity. They use it as an opportunity to tell God what they want, to tell God what they would like to have happen, to tell God a request of something that they would like to have as an outcome in their life, which means for a lot of Christians, and I'd imagine for a lot of us, prayer becomes very transactional. God becomes like that divine vending machine and the prayers that we offer up or, or the coins that go in. And as the prayers are offered up, as we put the prayer in, we expect to get what we want in return. But if this is not how prayer is supposed to operate, if this is not how prayer is supposed to work, then the question remains, what are we supposed to pray for? What do we pray for? Friends, Jesus answers this question in Matthew chapter six, specifically in verses nine through 13, which is the passage that we're focusing on throughout this series. And so if you're here and if you have your Bibles, feel free to go ahead and pull them out or on your phone, look it up, Matthew chapter six. We're gonna be in verses nine through 13. Uh, just, it, it's important to read the scripture with it. The words will be on the screen, but feel free to look and join in however. And we're gonna be picking up in verse nine where Jesus says this about prayer. Pray then like this. When you pray, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. How many of you have heard this prayer before? How many of you are familiar with this scripture? Friends, this is one of the more familiar scriptures, passages in the Bible, right? It's the prayer that we often refer to as the Lord's prayer or the model prayer because it's the prayer that Jesus modeled to his disciples, meaning his followers and modeled to the people around him. And, and it's something that many of us learned as kids, whether we grew up in the church or not. It's one that we're familiar with either reading in scripture. Some of us didn't know that it was found in scripture. It's what we, we learned as kids. It's a very familiar prayer and it's a familiar passage. And I want you to notice that, that while in the beginning, the prayer starts out focusing on God, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, God in heaven, holy are you, you are holy. In verses 11 through 13, the focus shifts and turns to us. Our Father in heaven, holy are you, but then it's give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us. Give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us. That's verses 11 through 13 about us. Now, next week, we're gonna be moving into the uh, lead us and deliver us part of this prayer. So I'm really gonna stop at verses 11 and 12, which I like to call the gimme for gimme uh, portion of this prayer. Jesus says here to pray to God, for, for God to give us this day our daily bread and to forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. So real quick here, what does this mean? Well, well in the Old Testament, God's people, the Israelites, they were making their way through the wilderness following their exodus uh, from Egypt. And along the way, as they were making their way through the wilderness, they grew hungry, they grew tired, and they grew weary, even considering turning around and returning to a life of slavery and bondage in Egypt. Why? Because at least there they had basic provisions. There they had food to eat instead of having to wander through the wilderness, wondering where their next meal would come from. So they were complaining some, they were praying some and seeing their needs and hearing their prayers, God responded and miraculously fed his people, the Israelites, 
by raining bread down from heaven, manna coming from heaven, just what they needed for the day. Therefore, give us this day our daily bread. It's not to be confused as like, man, I hope that it's buy one, get one at Publix today, or it's not ordering at Panera. Like, yeah, let me get this uh, daily bread, the daily special. No, bread, it's a symbol of God's provision. Okay, so it's not specific bread. It's not a specific loaf of bread. Like I need to eat that one and not that one. Bread is a symbol of a sign of God's provision. In verse 12, the part about asking God to forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, the debts that Jesus is referring to here are our sins. All right, and seeing that Jesus uh, has already forgiven us of our sins, Jesus is suggesting something different here. He's suggesting that we continually put ourselves in a position to humbly and honestly acknowledge our need and our dependence on God's mercy, on God's love, and on God's grace to continually position ourselves, understanding that we're all sinners, that we mess up, that we're not perfect. And so it's forgive me for the wrongdoing. Forgive me for the ways that I've been separated from you and from loving the people around me. If we're asking forgiveness for our sins is, is a way of continually making things right with God and continually making things right with the people around us. So here Jesus is saying, when you pray, pray that God's gonna provide your basic needs, not an abundance of just loaves of bread falling down, but your basic needs, just what you need for that day, for this day, nothing more, nothing less. This part of the the model prayer is is a recognition for our need for a God who provides and our need for a God who forgives, the only one who can forgive us for our wrongdoing and the separation between God and others. So it's an important part of this prayer. It's acknowledging God as provider. You are the one who provides my every need, just what I need, not necessarily what I want, but my every need. And you are the one who offers forgiveness. But here's the thing. While the, 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 the gimme, forgive me prayer is uh, biblical and as Jesus instructed, again, I want you to notice that the focus of the prayer continues to be on us. There are prayers about, uh, that focus on our needs being met. They're providing us what we need, focusing on our forgiveness, our getting right with God and with others. And as we've already discussed in previous series, but as we looked at last week, the entire focus of prayer should not be on us. The focus of prayer should not be on our wants, on our needs, on our desires. The focus is actually just the opposite. Should be on God. And the truth is, if, if provisions, God providing for us is the only thing that we're praying for, if, if forgiveness, forgive me for that, forgive me for this is the only thing that we're asking for, then we have overlooked a central component of prayer and we've skipped past what it is that Jesus says we are to be praying for. And so I want us to go back to verse 10. And in verse 10, we find before the, the gimme, forgive me part of the prayer, Jesus uh, says, let your primary focus of prayer be this. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, holy are you, holy is your name. And then we're to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus says, when you pray, acknowledge God's holiness, acknowledge the one that you are going before. But then first and foremost, we're to pray for God's kingdom to come, the coming of God's kingdom and for God's will to be done. The King James version uh, uh, version of the Bible says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And God's will and God's kingdom, the kingdom of God go hand in hand. You see, Jesus revealed the will of God, God's plans, God's purposes, his life, his ministry, his teaching, his miracles, his death, his resurrection. It's God's plans for salvation, forgiving us from sin and reconciling us into right relationship with God. And the kingdom of God part, well, that was central to the the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ. It was the message that he proclaimed everywhere that he went. 
establishing, inaugurating the, the kingdom of God on earth, throughout the earth as it is in heaven. And it was also the way of life that he set out to establish with those around him. The kingdom of God was central not only to his message, but his mission and his ministry. And so what does this mean? What does this mean? What, what, why should we pray this? Well, this is important. You see, a kingdom is territory that's ruled by a king. All right, and, and the kingdom of God, it refers to a world that is under the rule of God. It refers to a world where Jesus is king, where Jesus is the authority. It's a world that is guided by the authority of Jesus Christ, his rules, his laws, his commands, his morals. So friends, Jesus is saying our prayers should focus on the kingdom of God being established and the will of God, God's will being done, not the other way around. You see, he's saying that, that our prayers should be, God, I want you to reveal who you are in my life to me and to those around me and throughout the world. God, build your kingdom here. Does not say for us to say, build my kingdom, what I want. It's where to be praying, God, you set the world right however it is that you see fit, doing whatever you think is best. God, let your will be done, not mine. You see, Jesus makes it clear that, that prayer is aligning our wants and our will with the wants and the will of God. It's surrendering, letting go of the pursuit of our kingdoms, that which we have authority over, that which we rule for the pursuit of God's kingdom. Simply put, Jesus teaches that, that our prayer should be focused solely on God's kingdom coming to earth and dwelling around us, being around us and God's will being done and that our prayer should not be the other way about our will and our kingdom. So friends, let me ask you this. If we pause here just to reflect and to think about our prayer life, what is it that you are praying for? We've heard what Jesus uh, teaches, taught, modeled on prayer, but let me ask you just to think for yourself, to take it in, what are you praying for? What are you praying about? What are, you, what are you praying will happen? What are you asking God to do? What are you asking God for? What are you telling God? What, oh, are you praying for whatever it is that's right in front of you? Are you praying for the things that you can see or the things that you don't see, that you wanna see? Are you, are you praying that good things will happen to you? Every time you go before God, are you like, hey, God, I, I, I have some needs. I've got some circumstances that I'd like to be uh, adjusted or changed. Are you praying for your needs, for your success, for your happiness? Are you praying that your circumstances would, would turn around, would improve or would change or, or your life would go exactly as planned or your future would turn out exactly how you want? Uh, another way that I could ask is this, when you pray, are your prayers, thy kingdom come or my kingdom come? Are they thy will be done or is it my will be done? What are you praying for? What are you saying when you're talking to God? What is it that you want to see established? What is it that you want to happen in your life and in the world around you? What are you praying for? In his book, Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster suggests this about prayer. He writes, in prayer, real prayer, we begin to think God's thoughts after him, to desire the things he desires, to love the things he loves, and to will the things he wills. I want that to sink in. He says in prayer, real prayer, like genuine, heartfelt, not, not a show, not a performance, but in real prayer, what happens is we begin to think God's thoughts after God, to desire that which God desires, to love the things that God loves and to will the things that God wills. You see, prayer isn't just a quick nod to a holy and sovereign God and then rattling off these personal requests in an attempt to convince God to grant us our wants, our desires, our dreams, or an attempt to persuade God to do what we think is best. But prayer is, is putting ourselves in a position uh, to where our desires become what God desires. 
where, where we want what God wants, where we love what God loves, where we will what God wills. Prayer is shifting our focus away from us and whatever it is that's right in front of us and on to God. Prayer is shifting the focus away from our kingdoms, what we rule and, and have authority over, and it's turning it towards our focus towards God's kingdom. And so friends, the big idea that I have for us today is this. Prayer is focusing on God's kingdom, not attempting to increase our own. Prayer is focusing on God's kingdom, not looking for ways to increase our own. You see, prayer is not a divine wish list to where we're telling God what we would like or where we're telling God what we want or, or what we would like to happen. No, prayer is first and foremost communion with God. It's intimacy with God. It's, it's connecting with our heavenly father and focusing on all things God and being able to see beyond whatever it is that's going on in front of us, whatever it is that is before us, whatever it is that we've been focusing on and being able to see a bigger picture beyond that, seeing what it is that God would like for us to see. Let me ask, do does anybody know what a, a stereogram is? Cool, this is gonna be a great illustration, not a single soul note. Okay, <laughs> have you heard of a, a magic eye, the 3D illusion? If you were a kid in the 90s, maybe as I explained, it'll start to come. Have you heard of the Highlights magazines? Yeah. All right, oh, there, we're starting somewhere. So Highlights magazines in it, there's old mazes, games, tic-tac-toe, but then there's also that picture, it's a 2D picture, right? That if you stare at it and look at it in a different way, it becomes another picture. There's a picture behind it. Okay, it's called a stereogram. I just learned that this week too, but it was in these books, a magic eye. And so it's the pattern that's cr a lot of colors, a lot of, it's just all busy. And when you look at it in a different way, you kind of focus in on it, look through it, you begin to see another 3D picture reveal itself behind. Are you tracking with me now? At least lie to me. This is the only time I'm asking you to lie. Like just be like, yes, great, we got it, we're with you. Imagine a busy pattern, you're looking at it, through it, you see a 3D pattern. All right, God created some people to where they can look at them right away and they see the image, they see the 3D image. And then others, he created to where it takes them in eternity. For me, God created me to where it takes me in eternity to try and figure this out. And I remember it being so frustrating. I'd sit in the dentist office because that's where all the highlights magazines are in any kind of medical office. And I would sit there and I'd open it up and I would look at it, but I could never get it right away. And then someone told me one time, and I don't know who it was that was offering me advice on Highlights magazines, but someone told me that the trick was not looking directly at the 2D picture, the pattern in front of you, all right? But they said, you need to start close to your nose and then slowly move it away as you try and keep your eyes focused on the picture. All right, they said, don't look directly at it. Don't look at the image focusing on the surface. Instead, stare at the picture, hold it up close to your nose. And then as you pull it away, try and look past it and let your eyes get cross-eyed. That was the trick to it. So basically I think I was being pranked because I would sit in the dentist's office and I would hold a Highlights magazine up to my face and I would slowly pull it away as people are around wondering what's going on. And then my eyes would slightly just cross. And so there I am sitting at the dentist looking like a maniac. And I'm not sure if this was really the trick to getting me to see the magic eye or if it was just a prank, but either way it worked on me. Cause I would sit there and I would work on this forever, holding it close to my nose, pulling it close and then slowly pulling the picture away, attempting to look through the picture beyond the pattern and see the bigger picture. But for some reason, I could never get it. All I could see was that which was in front of me, the pattern that was in front of me until one day it happened. One day as I'm looking at this picture, pulling it slowly away and my eyes are starting to cross and, and lose focus, I was finally able to see it. It was this beautiful, colorful dolphin jumping out of the water, the same colors that are there, but I saw this dolphin and I thought it's taking me so long to get this. I better stay here as long as I can, soak it in, get the image, but then it went away. And when I looked at the picture again, immediately I saw Flipper. There it was, the dolphin. I could see it right away. I was able to see the picture behind it, the 3D image. 
I was able to see what was beyond the surface right away. And from that point on, anytime I would look at that particular one or any of these stereograms now, you know, or a 3D, the magic eye, I could immediately see whatever that 3D picture was behind. From that point on, once I learned it, once I'd practiced it, what I'd spent so much time focusing in on ended up being the only thing I could see. You tracking with me? I spent so much time drawing that pattern close, trying to look beyond what was right in front of me and to see the bigger picture behind. And then when it started to click, when I started to figure it out, that became the only thing I could see. It wasn't just a busy pattern. I saw what was behind it. Friends, I think this is what it's like with prayer. I think this is what Jesus is suggesting with prayer. Prayer is drawing close to God. You don't have to go cross-eyed. You don't have to try and get them all up in your face, but prayer is, is drawing close to God. Prayer is spending time with God. Prayer is looking beyond the immediate. It's looking beyond the, the nuggets, the mac and cheese, the strawberries, even the wallet that I've placed to the side. It's looking beyond whatever it is that is right in front of us and looking beyond whatever it is that we've been accustomed to looking at and focusing in on. And it is focusing in on the bigger picture, focusing in on what God wants us to see beyond the immediate, beyond what's in front of us, that bigger picture that lies beyond. You see, prayer is an invitation for us to, to not just look beyond that which we are focused on, but it's also an invitation for us to look beyond ourselves, all that is going on around us and everything that is on our plate. And it's an opportunity for us to surrender our desires and our affections, to exchange our wills and our kingdoms for God's will and God's kingdom. Can I get an amen there? Amen. And friends, when this happens, when God's will and God's kingdom becomes the focus of our hearts and our minds and our prayers, I guarantee you all of the other stuff that we have been focusing in on, all of the other stuff that we've been striving after and pursuing, all of the other stuff that we thought that we've been needing, that we've been praying for, we've been begging for, and we've been asking for, all of that other stuff, when we're focused on God's will and God's kingdom, everything else will fade into the background. Everything, anything and everything that is tied to or connected to our wills and our kingdoms, every prayer, every request, every want, wish, and desire, every worry, burden, and concern, all of it will no longer seem to be the focus. Why? Because we've acknowledged who is king and we've acknowledged whose kingdom really matters. And so perhaps the bigger idea for us to leave with today is this. What we pray for reveals who we believe sits on the throne. The content of our prayers, what it is that we're saying to God, asking from God, what we are praying for, that reveals who we believe sits on the throne. And friends, the answer to this question will only be one of two things. It's either Jesus sitting on the throne, it's either God's kingdom or it's us. We sit on the throne and it's our kingdom. You see, either Jesus is king, either it's his will, his kingdom that we're pursuing, his will, his kingdom that we're focusing in on, his will, his kingdom that we are praying for, or it is ours. And friends, when it comes to the kingdom of God, there can only be one king and his name is Jesus. Jesus being the king who is all powerful, who is all knowing, who is God himself coming to be with us, who, who loves unconditionally, who offers unlimited mercy and unlimited grace and, and who's come to not only be with us, but to provide a rescue plan for us on the cross. There's only one king in the kingdom of God and it's Jesus who gives us exactly what we need. Maybe not everything that we ask for, that we want or that's on the wish list, but gives us exactly what we need. It's the king who forgives us for all of our sins, past, present and future. 
and the king who leads us where we need to be and delivers us from those moments in time when we try to take power and authority and take over the throne for ourselves. There's only one king in the kingdom of God, and that's Jesus. And friends, let me suggest to you that when Jesus is on the throne, when we recognize that Jesus is on the throne, with him on the throne and with him as our king, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of the wish list, regardless of what it is that is before us, our prayers have already been answered. And when Jesus is on the throne, with with him on the throne, with him as our king, We have absolutely everything that we need. Amen? Will you pray with me? God in in heaven, holy are you, holy is your name. Lord, we recognize our position before you knowing that you are God and we are not. And with that, we have been uh, modeled to pray in a way where we do recognize you as the provider, as the forgiver, as the one who will lead and deliver. And so we pray for that. We pray that you would give us just what we need, being okay with the fact that it's nothing more or nothing less. We pray that you would continue to forgive us, to, to bring us back into right relationship with you and with others that you would lead us to where you would have us to go and that you would deliver us from all evil. But God, we also focus our prayers, not just on what you offer to us and do for us, but what you want in this world and in our lives. And so we pray that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, as we sacrifice and surrender our kingdoms and our wills for yours as revealed through Jesus Christ in whose name we pray, amen.